Well, good morning. Thanks for making me feel welcome. I appreciate that. So I never get nervous being up here, so that just helps calm some of the nerves. But I get the opportunity this morning to kick us off on a three-week series or study on looking at the life of a steward. So we just came out of what a uh, series in the month of January, Serve the Lord. We're going to start a three-week study on the life of a steward. And so I really struggled, I'll be honest, with where to even go with the life of the steward because as we're going to look at today, it, is, it encompasses everything. Everything that we have, everything of who we are is to be stewarded for God. So how, how do I, where do I land with this? Where do I go with this? And so I apologize in advance if I ramble, rabbit trail, do whatever. I started writing for this thing and I'm like 10 pages in, which for me, normally it's six to eight. And I'm going, where, where, where do I stop? And so I'm thinking, I got to cut this. I got to cut that. And I hope that this morning, and my prayer has been this morning, that God would just use me to somehow encourage us to be better stewards, to be, have a better understanding of what a steward is, and just to honor him with our lives. But as we come from the, the study, Serve the Lord, into the study of stewardship, I want us to look at 1 Peter 4.10, and this isn't going to be our main passage, but 1 Peter 4.10, as we kick this off, it says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's a couple things in this passage I feel like just really will help us transition, but even are vital to understand stewardship, to understand what it means to be a steward of God. And here it says that it's, again, the gifts were given to us by God, by the strength that God supplies. And then it goes to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. It's all about him. From Genesis 1-1, from the first verse in this book to the end, Revelation chapter 22. And I went back and read Revelation 22 before I said this. It is all about him and his authority. In the beginning, God created. God created all things. And God does, n- does not ever give up his authority. He does not give relinquish his authority with anything or in any way while we know that god created man and he created man in his image but he created man when he's having that conversation with the trinity and he says let us create man in our image and to give him dominion over our creation this word dominion while it has some sense of possession and sense of ownership never removes the ownership from the one who actually owns it all, right? God has dominion forever and ever, amen. But God has placed us in positions of authority over his creation, absolutely. Even over many of the things that he skilled us with, even who we are as a person as we'll look at today. And I think of a wonderful, just biblical illustration of stewardship. I think of Joseph. I think of In the story of Joseph, when he is brought into Potiphar's house, he's purchased and he's just doing the best he can as a servant, as a steward for Potiphar and then raises to this position of power. Of course, then he goes to jail and then with the dream, he goes into Pharaoh's court and he becomes second in charge. Pharaoh gives him his signet ring and basically anything that Joseph says goes under the authority of Pharaoh. And at any time, Pharaoh can relinquish or take this this power from Joseph. Joseph does not own his position. Joseph does not own Egypt, but he stewards it under Pharaoh's authority, 
under Pharaoh's possession. So as we think of ourselves as a steward, or we think of what a steward is, a steward is one who manages and cares for something that is not their own. Now, a steward doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as servant or slave. You can be a steward and not a servant or a slave, but a servant or a slave would be a steward. And so, as children of God, as slaves, as servants of God, we are his stewards. And so a steward understands that they are to manage and care for something that is not their own. But a faithful and good steward goes a step further, and their desire is to bring honor to their master. They, a good steward, a faithful steward, works not for his own success, but for the success of his master, of the, for the one who owns it all. If I was to take this kind of in a modern day example or illustration, I think of em- employers and employees. An employer is looking for faithful stewards, employees. Employees who will take some ownership in their responsibilities, but ultimately they, they don't own the company. But their aim, you're looking for employees that will work hard for the success of the company, that will represent the company well. That is what I I believe, I'm not an employer, but an employer is looking for. It's someone who will steward their business, the job, the task that they've given over to them well to bring the company success, to bring the company honor. We're going to look at the book of Malachi together today. It's the last book in the Old Testament. So if you know where Matthew is, just go back one. And we're going to look at Malachi not as an example of good stewardship, which is our goal this morning and and what a steward oversees, but an example of poor stewardship. But as the famous adage goes, right, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I believe God has given us this in his word to learn from mistakes that others have made so that we don't repeat it. Now, I'll be honest, as I read through the things we're going to, as I study the things that we're going to be discussing this morning, I have failed over and over, just like the tribe of Judah does in Malachi. But I hope we also see that God is gracious and God is good. And I hope that this will encourage us to not be okay with failure, but instead to provoke us to do a better job honoring the Lord together this morning. As we read this book, there's a couple things we need to understand and remember. All right, this is the last book in the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, but they're under this a, a couple covenants actually at this time or promises. Um, so they're, the children of Israel, or specifically in this, they're talking to Judah Right, the southern tribe of Israel. So when I talk about Israel and you see Judah, it's, they're, they're one and the same in the sense of the promises. But Judah is under the Mosaic covenant, the law that God had given to Moses. So they were to follow certain rules and rituals, and they were, they're, they're doing that. But they're also, and we'll kind of see this throughout the book, they're also under the Abrahamic. Right? God has chosen Israel as his own. And nothing can separate them from the love of God or from being his chosen people. But there's two types of covenants. While the Abrahamic one is an unconditional, there's nothing that the Israelites can do to mess it up. They're also living under this Mosaic covenant that God promised to bless those who do well and curse those who don't do well. And so as we read this, you're going to see a lot of, woe is me, how terrible, God, where are you? Why don't you listen to me? Why, you know, and it's, God's like, well, you're not doing well. Okay, you're, I love you, I chose you, but you're not doing well. So kind of remember that. And some of the promises here, too, aren't necessarily to us. But my goal, too, is as we walk through four different things, we're going to look at four different stewardship areas of our lives. As we work through them, I'm going to hopefully take us to several New Testament, if not just one New Testament passage that hopefully 
brings it all together for us this morning. But Malachi chapter 1, verse 1, we see the oracle, or basically that's not a word we use today, means divine message, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. This word Lord in your copy of God's word is most likely all caps, hopefully it is, and that's to reference the name Yahweh. Right, this was a name, Lord, that God gave to Moses and gave to the people of Israel when Moses is uh, at the burning bush. And he says, who, who should I say sent me? And, and God says, I, tell them I am has sent you, Yahweh. And this, in this word, Yahweh, or this name, this, this name that God has given to his people, it speaks of self-existence, self-sufficiency, and so again, we see that God is the supreme ruler of all things. He's before all things. So this is a word from the Lord, Yahweh, to Israel through Malachi. And in verses 2 through 5, we see God talking of his love for Israel. But then in verse 6, we see a relationship. And in verse 6, it says this. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts, or Yahweh of hosts, God of everything. O priests, you despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? So right off the bat, in verse 1, I want us to see that there's this picture. The picture of honor. As a son honors his father, as a servant his master, a faithful or good steward seeks to bring honor. A godly steward seeks to bring God honor with everything. And so as we look at these four areas, the goal of these four areas is to learn from their mistakes and to look at our lives, how we can better bring honor to our father, to our master, as his stewards. So the first one is we need to steward the life or the life we've been given. We need to steward our lives. Malachi 1, picking up in verse 6, but you say, have we despised your name by offering polluted food on my altar? But you say, have we polluted you by saying that the Lord's table may be despised? All right, they might not be saying it with their words, as we'll see. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that... There were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. So at this time in Israel's history, they are offering sacrifices. If you were to go back to Leviticus, you'll see a lot of examples and uh, descriptions of what sacrifices were to be, how they were to be done. We see mandatory sacrifices. That would include even sacrifices for the sins of the people. And again, these, these are the priests that God's rebuking at this time. But they were to offer sacrifices for sins. These were mandatory. But there were also sacrifices that were voluntary. Sacrifices of thanksgiving. But still, there were instructions on how to do that. And one of the things, one of the instructions was that these sacrifices were to be without blemish. They were to be taken care of. They were, to, they were the best of the flock. They were the prized possession of, of, your, or of your animals or even of your produce or your, um, what, your crops. And you might say, well, where does this Old Testament come into how do I steward my life, this, this sacrificial system? Let me first 
try to tie it in and say that we are not offering sacrifices anymore because of what Christ accomplished for us in our place. We do not offer these mandatory sacrifices for, for sin because Christ has done that in our place. We know scripture tells us that really even these sacrifices in the Old Testament aren't what saved. They were a action of what uh, they were action of obedience because of the faith that God had given to them because of the relationship they had with God. And so we in and of ourselves are not to um, sacrifice ourselves or make sacrifices for salvation. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He, he was presenting Christ. God gave Christ as a perfect sacrifice, holy. And the only gift that would be acceptable to God for sin. But we do see in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, there's an appeal. Paul says, I appeal to you, brethren, or I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So while we don't make sacrifices like literal burnt offering sacrifices today, we're still challenged and commanded to to make sacrifices And I would even put this as in in the voluntary category, voluntary sacrifices of thanksgiving. Again, there's nothing we can do for the remission of sin. That was accomplished, praise God, um, in Christ. Because if we tried to offer ourselves somehow as a sacrifice for sin, it it wouldn't be acceptable because we're not, We're with blemish. We're not without sin. But there is a challenge here. And there is something we can offer to God as a sacrifice. And that's the life that he has given to each and every one of us. God has given you breath. He's given you the bodies you have. He's given you the gifts you have. He's given you the talents you have. He's given you everything that that you would say is your life. The time that you have is a gift from God. The time you have on earth is a gift from God. The question I have for us today is what quality of, our, of this living sacrifice are we offering to God as an act of worship or sacrifice? The children of Israel in this passage were really offering God the leftovers, the things that after they've kept everything for themselves, lived for themselves, done what they've wanted to do for themselves, I'll give God really the leftovers, the things that maybe I don't even want. Again, they're making sacrifice, but what quality of sacrifice? God has given us the lives we have to be used for him. Again, we're, we're stewards Going back to everything that we have is is his. We were created to worship him. And so how are we stewarding this living sacrifice? If I was to think about this, I really, my brain just keeps going to time. When I think of the time that I offer God in my life, even coming on Sunday mornings, right? This is where we're living in this moment of time. We've gathered together to worship God in this time. What's the quality of this time that we are offering to the Lord? And I think of it, do I come to this place spent, exhausted? Because I was, again, not for doing good things yesterday, but living it up. I stayed up late binging on whatever show I want to watch, or maybe I was out having fun. I mean, not TV, it's I'm in a bowling league or I'm in this or that or I don't know what. But I'm exhausted when I get here. Every Sunday morning, I'm exhausted, but I'm here, right? God, I'm here. But yet I'm too tired to serve. I'm too tired to really even listen. I'm too tired to be an encouragement to others. I'm really just here between, uh, well, this is the 11 o'clock service, 11 to 12. I'm gonna get out of here as quick as I can because I need to go get a nap. I'll tell you, I am tired and ready for my nap. 
but what kind of sacrifice am I offering? Or do I prioritize this sacrifice? And I would even say with the physical, right? Even with my physical body that God's given to me, am I taking care of it so I can serve him more, so I can honor him more? What am I doing with the talents? And again, we've talked about the gifts over the last month. How am I stewarding these th- these all the blessings that I call my life as I offer it back to God? Or am I just giving him the leftovers? I'm going to use all his blessings for myself and my gain and my pleasure. Or am I going to honor God with it? The second area I want us to look at in Malachi chapter 2 is steward the faith you have been given. So we steward the life we've been given, but we're to steward the faith we have been given also. Malachi 2, picking up in verse 10, it says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughters of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And the second thing you do, you, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groanings, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? They're wondering, why doesn't God accept our, our offering? Because the Lord has witnessed between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her says, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. There's a lot going on really in this section. And again, as I said, each of these areas we're reading could be a message in and of itself. Self. But I want us to notice really two things happening. There's a physical adultery happening, but then there's also a spiritual adultery happening. So the children of Judah are marrying pagan wives. They're actually even leaving their wives for pagan wives. They weren't even supposed to be marrying people outside of the tribe of of Judah, of Israel. And And there's a reason why God had commanded this of his people. God had given, chosen his people to to put them in this covenant, this covenant relationship with him. One of, well, a faith. And it's not that God doesn't like or love other people, right? We see examples of Rahab in the city of Jericho when Joshua walked around and Rahab and her family were saved. Rahab is a Gentile, but yet becomes part of the Israel community and becomes one of them. So it's not so much that, but God knows that, again, if they start marrying people outside of their tribe, their faith, that they will begin to follow after their faith. And they will no longer be loving and serving him, but they will be loving and serving false idols, false gods. And God didn't save them unto that. God saved them for himself alone. So God says to not marry people outside of, the, outside of your faith, outside of my chosen people. Because if you do, this is going to affect generations to come. This is going to affect the, your kids. And he wants godly offspring. He wants this to continue. And so really by disregarding God's direction in the physical marriage, they're also disregarding the covenant that God has with them and committing spiritual adultery. Again, God commanded this idea of 
on the physical side of things, of this unequally yoked, because, uh, or let me read, I wrote it down. 2 Corinthians 6.14, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So here's in the New Covenant. All right, so you might say, well, that was the Old Testament. God doesn't care if we marry unbelievers now. Yes, he does. Do not be unequally yoked. And again, this yoke, if you can picture a cart and they would hook oxen up to a cart, a yoke was the wooden piece that would go across the the two oxen. And so the goal when they were pairing up oxen to pull a cart was to have two oxen that were of equal strength. Because if you had a strong oxen and you had a weak oxen, you'd be doing circles, right? You'd be going this way, like, and you're trying to go straight or you're plowing in the field. And so God says, don't be unequally yoked. And really, he goes on to say, what has darkness to do with light? If we marry, so the challenge to you, those who aren't married, don't date unbelievers. Save yourself the trouble. There is going to be difficulty because what fellowship has light with darkness? If you truly are living for the Lord, I mean truly living with no exception, as much as you love the unbelieving, unbelieving spouse, the Bible calls them an enemy of God. Now again, if you're married to an unbeliever, and I know we have some of those here, hey, Live for the glory of God so that they would see the gospel in you and that they would come to faith and repentance, that they would become a child of God. Again, Scripture talks about this, and I don't want to preach this, all right? But there's a reason God is doing this and making this command in the Old Testament and New Testament. But as they choose to fulfill their flesh, and disregard the faith that God has given them, to preserve the faith that God has given to the chosen people of Israel. In disregard to that, they have committed spiritual adultery. And again, it hasn't been that long ago that we studied the book of James, but if you were to look at James 4, 4 through 6, here's a New Testament example for us. You adulterous people, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that, get this, he has made to dwell in us. So God has given us this faith. But I also, I don't want to skip these last words in James 4, 4 through 6. But he gives more grace just like he gave Christ to us for atonement of sin. He has given us a faith that even though we neglect it and we abuse it, we don't walk in faith at times. And we're called adulterous people in James 4. God gives grace. Praise the Lord for that. But while he gives grace... It doesn't mean that as stewards we just ignore this responsibility. Again, our desire and goal this morning is to be good and faithful stewards that honor God with everything that he's blessed us with. So God has given us faith. So how do we honor God in faith with the faith that he's blessed us with? Do we profane the name of Christ They were profaning the name of Christ. They were supposed to be distinct, different, yet they chased the things of the world. We as believers, as Christians, are called to be different. Do we profane the relationship, the love covenant that we have with our Father? Do we profane his name by calling ourselves Christians to say we're part of of God's family, yet live as the world? Are we... Profane, as fancy word, disrespect. Are we disrespecting God? Do we seek after things that will hinder our faith? And when I say hinder our faith, again, God has given us faith, saving faith. Right? There's nothing that can separate us from that. God is going to hold us 
in the faith. But when I say hinder, it's more on our end. In that we don't, when we don't grow in faith, when we don't walk by faith, when we don't steward God's faith well, we hinder ourselves by living in a place of fear. We live in a place of fear. We live in a place of sin. We live in a place of shame. When, when we walk in faith, it casts out fear. We shouldn't be fearful. As we walk in faith, we put away sin. When we walk in faith, shame doesn't exist anymore. So God has given us this faith, but how do we steward it? Do we seek after the things of the world or do we stay faithful? Are we faithless like the people of Judah, of Israel? Are we faithful? Do we walk in it? There are helps God has given us to care for this faith that he has blessed us with. Things to help us grow in it. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the word. He's given us access to himself in prayer. He's given us the church to preach the word. He's given us the church to reprove and rebuke one another. He's given us the church to serve one another. As we use these helps, right? When we serve people, when we're in prayer, when we're under the preaching of the word, when we're rebuking and reproving one another, when we're listening to the Holy Spirit, when we're in the word, all these things help us grow in our faith and help us remain faithful to God. They help us put away fear, sin, and shame. So my question for us is, how are we stewarding the faith that God has generously given? Do we chase after the world, or are we staying faithful to him? Do we chase after the desires, or the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, the things that are desiring to the eyes, the things that are desiring to the flesh, the positions and power, status, or do we remain faithful to him? The next area I want us to look at is steward the resources you've been given. Steward your resources. In Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, we see God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Right there, that Abrahamic covenant. I don't change. Y'all are doing wrong, but I don't change, and that's why you're not consumed. But, remember the Mosaic Covenant. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Again, lots of people take this passage out of context. And without diving into this passage in great detail, some background of this passage. We see that God says, number one, at near the end of what we read, that he can destroy the soil or make the soil good. He can have the vine bear fruit or not bear fruit. Now what's happening here, and again, under the old law, the Mosaic law, the children of Israel were to to tithe, which a tithe literally means tenth. They were to give a tenth of their produce, give a tenth of their grain 
or their livestock. They were to give back a tenth to God. And they would do this by taking it to the priests. And really, this was God's system to provide for the children of Israel, but really to provide for the the priests. This was how they were to to live. They were to eat this food or sell the, the, the... this tithe to make money to pay for things. And so, but what we don't see in this passage is that God says you're robbing or stealing from the priests or the Levites. God says, who are you robbing by not giving the full tenth? You're robbing me, God says. I don't know why they were doing what they were doing. I mean, I can speculate, especially as we look later in this chapter, but they're not giving the full tenth. So it, it appears to be that they're giving something, right? They're, they're giving just like they were offering sacrifices, but not as God called them to. Now, again, we're not under the Old Testament law. God does not call us to give a a tenth of everything. Now there are New Testament principles and even commands that talk about how we are to give of our resources. In Acts, talks about it. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Philippians, 1 Timothy. And again, today is not to study this one area. But we see God still using the finances today that he has given to the people in the church to meet the needs of the church. 2 Corinthians 8 deals with this. 2 Corinthians 8, starting verse 1, says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty, have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means. Again, God had given them all different amounts. But they gave just according to their means. As I can testify, and beyond their means, as of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus, that as he had started so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Again, big picture. God uses the resources of faithful stewards to care for his church, to care for the church leadership, the ministry, the missionaries. And again, we're not going back to all the passages today or going even to the New Testament, all these New Testament passages of how this applies to us today. But we are to give of our resources. We're to give joyfully It is both good and right. This is a grace for you. And God has blessed each of us so much. And the question I ask is, do we rob God by holding back from being generous? Generous with the resources he has blessed us with. Or as we look at this next point, and our final point, is our focus in the wrong place? Malachi 2 Verse 17, steward your focus, steward your attention, your attitude, your actions. Malachi 2, 17 says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Malachi 3, 13 through 15, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge? Or of walking in as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. 
evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. The Israelites were so worried about everyone else around them prospering. And this did not please God or bring honor to God. Again, in this picture, we have them, they say, we obey your word. We're walking around as mourning. So you've got the tribe of Judah, who God's talking to here. They're appearing as though they're sad about their sin. They've, they've got sackcloth and ashes on and feeling remorseful of their sin. They, are, they think they're obeying God. And what good is it? Everybody else in the world, everybody else around us is prospering. It's vain. Why are we even doing this? Again, they're doing what they should be doing. They're obeying God. They feel sorrow for their sin. But in their hearts, they're wishing they were the other people. Their attitude was completely off. Their focus was wrong. They would have even been fine with, okay, maybe God's not going to give me financial gain, but God, don't give them financial gain. Cast your judgment on them. They're mocking you. At least do that. Then it's at least worth something to follow you, right? They're getting punished, and I'm not getting punished. So at least there's some kind of reward. But I want to take us to the New Testament. As I, as I hear this, I, I think of Peter. And Jesus' interaction with Peter in John 21, Jesus is talking to Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says what? Yes, I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, then feed my sheep. A third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. If you keep reading, Jesus then tells Peter how he's going to die. You love me? Well, this is how you're going to die. So spoiler alert, Peter. And I think Peter was probably okay with that. But what was silly is Peter then says, well, what about John? Okay, so you're, that's how I die. Well, what about John? How does he die? And Jesus says to him, what is that to you? What is that to you? Peter, feed my sheep. And Jesus says, if it's my will that John lives till I come again, that's, that's my choice, <laughs> not yours. Peter, feed my sheep. Get your focus right. Judah, stop worrying about everybody else. Stop worrying about the wicked prospering. Do what you're called to do. Malachi talks about it. Seth talked about it last week in 1 Corinthians 3. There is a day. If you read the end of Malachi, there is a day when God will judge the wicked. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, Judah. Be faithful. Keep your focus where it needs to be. Fix your mind on the things above. Seek the things that are above, Colossians 3. Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves. Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Don't worry about the rest of it. But our dissatisfaction leads to a life of stewardship that does not honor God. We might be doing the right things by action or outward. We might be sacrificing, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, but with what quality? We might be, say we're Christians, yet we don't live like Christians. We might give, but we don't give joyfully or faithfully. We might at times 
have our focus right. We might obey God and do these things, but our attitude with it is really envious of the world. But stewardship isn't just about the ritual or I checked it off. Again, going back to an employer and employee. An employer doesn't want an employee to just check the list off, but then they did it, but they didn't do a good job with it. They want them to do it right, to do it well. Again, I am thankful for God's grace when I do not do it well. But I hope it's each and every one of our desire as stewards of God to take the things that God has blessed us with, the life God has blessed you with, the faith he has blessed you with, the resources he has blessed you with, and to honor him with it, to give it back to him. What quality of life are you offering the Lord? Do you protect your faith from idol worship or do you let idols and the love of the world have your affections? Do you hoard the resources God has given you to steward? Do you let your mind worry more about what everyone else is doing rather than focusing on the Lord? It is about a relationship with our Father. It's about a relationship with our Master. It's not about a ritual. A godly steward seeks to bring honor to God with everything. Everything that God has entrusted to you, which is everything you have, breath, speech, clothes, house, job, family, the list could go on and on and on. Does it honor God? Are you using them to honor God? A godly steward seeks to bring honor to God with everything. Let's pray together this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. And first and foremost, Father, I thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. Father, that he came and lived the life that none of us in this room could have done. When we broke the relationship with you, Father, he came and lived a perfect life and willingly died on the cross, sacrificing himself to bring you honor and to bring you glory. But, Father, so that we can have a restored relationship with you, so that we can have the faith that you've even given us to steward. And Father, we are thankful for the faith that you have so graciously given to us. Father, we thank you for the security of that faith. Father, that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. But Father, I do pray for those that may be in this room that don't have this faith. God, that you would open their eyes, that they would that they would have the faith that leads to salvation. Father, that they would come to know you and that they too would be able to offer themselves as a living sacrifice. Father, that they too would be able to bring you honor with everything that you've entrusted to them. Father, we are so grateful this morning for your son and for our salvation. And Father, we're grateful for the many resources you have blessed us with. But Father, help us to keep our attention and our focus on bringing you honor. Lord, help us to remember we are just stewards of what you own, what you possess. And Father, everything is to, is to be done for your glory. You are the one with dominion and authority forever and ever. So Father, help us to serve you well. Help us to live for you well. Lord, help me and everyone in this room to see the area in our lives that we are not stewarding as we ought to. Areas that we can grow in. Areas that we can do better in bringing you honor. Lord, help us to know that you alone are worthy this morning. Help us be reminded of that. And Lord, help us to be reminded of that tomorrow and Tuesday, Wednesday, and throughout the rest of the week. And Lord, our desire is as we bring you honors, the honor that others would see our good works and see how we steward our lives so that they too would come and glorify you. 
the one who has given us all things and has given them all things. Lord, take this truth, help it to to stick in our, and stay in our minds and, and in our hearts. Lord, help it to change us. We love you and we thank you for your word and we thank you for this church and we thank you for your grace again. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen.